Good morning, everybody. Oh, we have more coming in. So hi, welcome. First of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Peggy Cribben, and I'm staff here at HDSA. And like Louise said in the opening ceremonies, we are just so delighted to see so many of you here in 2022. It feels so good to be together. Um, and we're just so delighted you're going to spend the weekend with us, get some great education, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun along the way, too. So uh, this session is HD 101, and I want to welcome uh, Marissa Dean, MD. She's the co-director of HTSA, the, Cell uh, the Center of Excellence at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And uh, we can't thank you enough for being with us here today uh, to give us some great information, and uh, we hope, uh, we know you'll enjoy her presentation. So uh, Marissa, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Marissa Dean. Um, I am a neurologist at um, our site at UAB, which is a level one center of excellence. Um, one of my interests is education and particularly education of patients and families. So I'm very excited I get to talk to you guys today about HD 101. And I have geared this lecture that hopefully, no matter if you have any medical background or not, you will understand a little bit better uh, HD uh, after you leave the session. All right, so just a couple of housekeeping slides. Um, so I'm not going to be giving any kind of specific recommendations for treatment today. Um, encourage you to all speak with your providers or neurologists. All right, and a couple other housekeeping. Um, keep, make, make sure that you keep your mask on unless you're eating or drinking. Um, I just have my mask off here at the podium. Um, and remember, if you guys want to ask questions, and I encourage you to, they want us to do it through the app, correct? All right. Great, and so that was just a summary that we will, or I'll be going over the questions at the end after the presentation. So if you have a question um, that you see when I'm talking, go ahead, just put that in the app and I'll address it at the end. Great, okay, so let's start with Huntington's disease. So how did Huntington's disease start? So like a lot of diseases in medicine, um, we learn about diseases by observation. So George Huntington, at a young age of 22 years old, first described Huntington disease in an article in 1872. Um, so he noticed um, that there were these uh, families that had chorea, or the involuntary movements, that seemed to pass from one generation to the next generation. He also made a note that if those children never developed the disease, it seemed to stop, and it did not continue onward after that. We in the medical world like to call this the pure, I say pure in quotes, <laughs> prototypical genetic disorder, uh, because if you have the certain mutation that we know is associated with Huntington's disease, that means that you will go on to develop Huntington's if you live long enough. And in the world of genetics, that's actually not something that we see a lot of. There's a lot more intricate players um, in whether someone develops a disease or not. All right, so this um, is a schematic of incidence and prevalence of Huntington's. And so what incidence means is the number of new cases of Huntington's disease per year. Uh, prevalence means the number of people living with Huntington's dis disease at any given time. Um, so in this um, picture of the world map, you'll see that we have it separated into Western populations and Eastern populations. And I want you, what I want you to pay attention to is that the incidence and the prevalence, or how many people have HD, vary significantly depending on where you live, right? So if you are a part of the Western population, like we are here in Atlanta, um, the prevalence or the number of people with HD is higher than if you lived in the Asian country. Um, either way that you look at it, Huntington's is still a rare disease, right? Huntington's is a great community, but it's still considered a rare disease. All right, so before we go forward, um, I want to define a few terms, um, if you've never heard them before, because we talk about them a lot with Huntington's disease. So when we say that HD is hereditary, what that means is that, is that there are characteristics that are passed down from one generation to the next. Now this could be any characteristics, so this could be hair color, this could be height, this could be eye color, um, those things are hereditary. But HD is also considered a genetic disease. Right? This means that the disease is a result of an abnormality in your genome, otherwise known as your DNA. Okay, so then let's go on to define those further. 
Every time I give you a definition, it brings up a new word. <laughs> so your genome is your complete set of your genetic material, and your DNA is what we call the carrier of the genetic material. Now, as I say those out loud, those sound like kind of abstract topics <laughs> or abstract terms, so I'm going to try to make this a little bit easier to understand. Um, so we're going to use an analogy. Now, I did not um, <laughs> talk to Dr. Wild, and so I don't have a Star Wars analogy for you today. <laughs> and that was phenomenal. Um, but I like to use encyclopedia analogy. Okay, and so let's imagine that you have two encyclopedias. Okay, one encyclopedia was given to you by your mother. We're going to call this the Britannica. Okay, one encyclopedia was given to you by your father. We're going to call this the World Book. Right, so both encyclopedias have similar information, but not quite the same, right? And so also within the encyclopedia itself, each book contains different information. So like book A is gonna have different information from book F. But if you look at book A in the Britannica, book A in the World Book, they will have similar information. Okay, so thinking of the two encyclopedias together, you can think of that as your genome, right? That's all your information, all your genetic information. Okay, and so we're going to split it, we're just going to keep going down smaller and smaller. So starting with the genome, next we're going to talk about chromosomes. So I think this may have been mentioned, a lot of these terms that were mentioned earlier in the uh, opening session. Um, and so think of each book of the encyclopedia as a chromosome. So for example, all right, we take out one book, that would be one chromosome. And so each book or each chromosome is going to contain di different information but you need all the books to have the complete set. Um, so to make the analogy to a chromosome in our, um, in our genome, each person has or two pairs of 23 chromosomes. So you see this is a picture of um, a karyotype here, right? And it's showing you 22. As you'll see, I said 23. Well, you've got your sex chromosomes here, the X and the Y. Okay, and so I just, you know, just kind of enlarged the picture of one chromosome. Right, and your chromosomes are going to contain that genetic information just very condensed, really tight. And so when we look at the stain of the chromosomes, you, they look like little lines or little curves. Great. Now we're going to get even smaller. Now we're going to talk about a gene. So think about, again, you've got, your, um, you've got your world book, which is your genome. It's composed of other books, which we're calling our chromosome. And in e each book, there are a lot of sentences. So we're going to call the sentences the gene. Okay, so within each book, there are a lot of sentences and a lot of different genes, right? So each sentence, again, is going to contain specific information that you're not going to find anywhere else in the book, All right? And so the same way that each book has a lot of sentences, your chromosomes have a lot of genes, okay? And so in Huntington's disease, um, the uh, Huntington gene is found on chromosome 4. Um, the Huntington gene is also called HTT, um, okay? Hopefully this is making sense. We're going to go one more level smaller because we mentioned, we talked about the CAG repeat, right? So CAGs are nucleotides, okay? And so we're going to call each letter of a word a nucleotide. So if you start with your genome, which is the world book, you've got many different chromosomes, which are the books. And within each book, there are many sentences, which are the genes. And then the sentences are broken up even further into letters. And we're going to call those the nucleotides. Okay? So different combinations of different letters, again, are going to create different words. Different combinations of the different nucleotides are going to create different codes as well. All right. And so this is just showing you in, um, in our genes. Um, the nucleotides can combine in different ways to give you different codes. Okay, and in our DNA, we have four different nucleotides. We have, let's, I just shorten them to C, T, A, and G. And so in Huntington's disease, the three nucleotides that repeat over and over are C, A, G, or CAG, if you guys have heard that. All right, and so your genetic material is your DNA, and your DNA is everything, okay? Your genome is all of your DNA together. Okay, so hopefully that was... Um, a, a nice summary that makes it a little bit easier to understand as I go forward and we're going to start talking about genes and chromosomes and the CAG repeats. So the genome, think of big, big picture, the two encyclopedias. Chromosomes will represent each book. A gene would be a sentence in a book. Nucleotide would be each letter in the sentence. Great. 
Okay, so now we're going to go on and talk more about HD. Okay, so HD is a genetic disease that we said earlier, um, and it results from a problem with the DNA, a problem with your genetic material. Um, another term that we use for an abnormality in DNA is called mutation. So I'm sure you guys have heard this before. Um, another term for a mutation is a variant, okay? Um, a mutation is usually the term we use when it causes disease, but variants are actually very common, and everyone has more than 4 million variants in each person, which is the difference than we would expect um, in your DNA. Right, and that's normal. That, that is what makes everyone unique and everyone looks different, acts different. Um, that's what makes us people. Um, but occasionally these variations or variants can cause disease. Okay, and so the type of disease that can be caused could be mild disease, could be a severe disease, just depending on how the variant disrupts your sequence. Okay, so we're gonna give a couple examples. All right, so using the encyclopedia analogy, let's start with a sentence which represents the gene. Okay, let's say the sentence is, the cat jumped over the moon. Let's say we're gonna change that sentence with a substitution. So we're gonna change the T in cat to an R. All right, so now it reads, the car jumped over the moon. Right, so the content or that sentence now means something completely different than the, one, than the actual sentence of the cat. Right, cars don't jump. At least I don't think they jump. <laughs> and so that's a confusing sentence. Well, let's take a different variation. Let's say instead we have just a small little deletion. So instead we say the cat jump over the moon. Okay, so you still understand what the sentence means, right? The grammar may not be as correct, um, but you can see that, that the change in the sentence in the second example is less severe than the change in um, the first example. Okay, and now let's talk about HD. So those are two types of changes you can sometimes see in your, um, in your DNA. Um, but let's talk about what happens with HD. So I'm gonna give you another example or another sentence. All right, let's say the sentence is, the giraffe likes to eat and eat and eat. You guys probably know where I'm going with this. All right, and so let's say that end part, E and E, gets repeated over and over. And so now it's the giraffe likes to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And if you keep saying that over and over and over for minutes, you may forget you're even talking about a giraffe. <laughs> and so the sentence loses its meaning. And so Huntington's disease is caused by this, this type of a repeat expansion. That as that repeat expansion gets more and more, longer and longer, and ends up causing disease. All right, so we talk a lot about CAG and CAG. Um, so in Huntington's disease, the number 40, okay, so when that repeat length gets to the number 40 or higher, right, that is um, big enough for it to cause disease and abnormality to that gene and production of the Huntington protein. Okay, this is, pos this is a positive result, meaning that if you live long enough, you will go on to develop symptoms of Huntington's disease. Now, a negative result or a normal CAG repeat length is 26 or fewer. Okay, that's the normal range. We have two other possibilities. One is, we'll go with the normal but mutable range. So you may wonder, you know, how do we get to 40? Like how does someone have normal CAG repeats and then how does 40 develop? Right, 40 could happen spontaneously. So there could just be a random change or a random um, variation that happens. We call this de novo, meaning it just happens suddenly by chance. Um, but in other situations, this repeat number, once it gets above 26, which could have been by chance, it becomes more unstable and more likely to increase in length in future generations. So that length between 27 to 35 still is considered normal, so not enough to cause Huntington's disease, um, but it's unstable and in future generations that could continue to get higher. Now the real unknown repeat length, so I said that Huntington's is a pure, in quotes, <laughs> a prototypical genetic disorder, because we do have a borderline range. So 36 to 39, this again, this is an unstable range, but there are some people who have this and never develop Huntington's disease and live a long, healthy life. There are other people, on the other hand, who do develop symptoms of Huntington's disease. So this, is, this area is still um, considered the borderline. All right, and we talked about the length of the CAG repeat. I was saying as it gets higher, right, it causes disease. So in the same sort of way of thinking, as that CAG, once it becomes abnormal at 40, if it continues to get higher and higher and higher, the disease also increases in severity. 
Um, and one way it increases in severity is that it presents at an earlier age. And so this graph here is showing you at the bottom, this is your CAG repeat starting at 40. You'll see there's a couple a little before 40. That was probably your 36 to 39. Um, and then you've got your going all the way up to 120. And then on the vertical axis, you have your age at motor symptom onset. So when symptoms start. And you'll see this nice um, kind of loop down that as the number, the CAG repeat length gets longer, age of onset gets earlier. Now this doesn't predict when symptoms will start. So for example, if you look at 40, let's say you have a repeat length of 40, um, each of these circles represents an individual. Um, you could have onset at the age of 20, you could have onset at the age of 60, onset of the age of 80. And so that's a big range. But as the number, as your repeat length, the number gets higher, that range kind of narrows and gets smaller. And so onset's gonna be earlier. Great, okay, so that's gonna lead us into discussion of um, a couple other genetic terms when we think about HD. All right, so I wanna talk about inheritance patterns. Um, so remember we talked about how you get one set of information from your mother and one from your father. And so some genetic diseases are gonna require that you have two abnormal genes in order to develop the disease. Okay, we call this autosomal recessive. There are other genetic diseases where you only need one abnormal gene or one abnormal mutation to cause disease. And we call this autosomal dominant. And so Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant disease, meaning that you only have to get that abnormal CAG repeat um, to come from one parent. Okay, so for those of you who like a schematic or are better at learning visually, all right, we're gonna go through an example. Okay, so up here at the top is gonna to be a parent with Huntington's disease. Here on the left is gonna be the unaffected parent. Here's our key. We're going to, um, I labeled a normal gene as a lowercase h and an abnormal or Huntington gene as an uppercase h. Okay, if any of you have ever seen or heard of a Punnett square, that's what this is. All right, and so your parent that has Huntington's has a mutated copy of, of Huntington, of the Huntington gene, which is the big H, and then also a normal copy, which is the little h. Unaffected parent has two normal copies. And so these are all of the possible outcomes for children, right? And so depending on which of these um, alleles or which of these, you know, if you get the, the mutated copy or the unmute or non or normal copy, you can get these four different outcomes. Okay, and to summarize, oops. So there's a 50% chance that the child will develop, will have the Huntington gene, right? So there's two out of four chance that the child could have an abnormal copy, and there's a 50% chance or two out of four chance that the child will not have Huntington's. And so this 50% um, risk um, is true for each individual child. So that risk does not, they do not add together um, you know, if one has HD, the other won't. Um, this is 50% chance each time. All right, and so now um, to make things just a little bit more confusing, um, so there's a little bit of a parental influence on the CEG repeat length. And so normally you would expect that CEG repeat length to remain the same or to be passed down to the next generation as the same number. So for example, if there's Huntington's disease in the mom, let's say she has 42 CAG repeats, that there would be a 50% chance that you know, her daughter or child would also have a 42 CAG repeat. However, if you um, have the same situation but the Huntington's is coming from the father, the chance that the, there's a higher chance that that repeat length could actually get higher or increase. And so for that same example, if instead the father had the CG repeat length of 42, it's possible that the daughter or child may inherit a 45 or a 42, right? Or even higher than 45, all right? And so as we showed in that graph before, how symptoms can start earlier if that CG repeat length gets higher, Sometimes the first person in a family that presents with symptoms of Huntington's disease is the child. It's not always the parent. Um, and so we call this anticipation when we see this occur. Okay, so now we've got some basics of the genetics of Huntington's disease. Well, I think we need to spend just a couple of slides talking about how Huntington's, the gene was actually discovered. Okay. All right, and so you can't have an HD 101 talk without crediting Nancy Wexler. 
Okay, so she, um, she really pioneered this project to identify the Huntington gene. So Nancy Wexler um, has a history of Huntington's disease and started in 1979 this great collaborative project where she got together 22 researchers and clinicians to go to the um, location with the highest population of Huntington's disease in the world. Okay, this was in Lake Maracaibo, um, which is located in Venezuela. And so they went there to basically just collect as many blood samples as they could. Um, they got more than 4,000 blood samples from the people that lived in Lake Maracaibo. Um, and it led to the discovery of the Huntington gene in 1983. And this is huge. Like, this was before, um, this was before, you know, the Cell the Genome Project. Um, so this was really revolutionary that she was able to get that done. All right, and then 10 years later, 1993, the Huntington's gene was actually sequenced. So we knew where it was, it actually got sequenced, the CAG repeat length was identified as the problem or the mutation in the chromosome um, done by Dr. Mac Drs. McDonald and Gisela. Um, and this was also another first. It was the first trinucleotide repeat expansion disorder that was discovered. All right, and so then this led to, once we found out what the problem was, where it was, this led to the ability for us to actually test people for Huntington's disease, right? And so this is what genetic testing does. It tests for that CAG repeat expansion. Okay, you may ask how accurate is this gene test? Actually pretty good. You don't really see this good of numbers in accurate in testing and many other tests that we order um, as clinicians. So a 98.8% .8 chance that it's a true negative result, 100% chance that it's a true positive result. Okay, so that, and you would much rather want this with genetic testing. You would not want the chance, even if it was a 1% chance, that that test result actually was not positive. All right, and I'm not gonna go into the details of why it's not 100% let you negative today. All right, but there's two situations when you can have genetic testing done. Okay, one could be confirmatory, so you have symptoms that could be consistent with Huntington's disease. You order the gene test and you find out if you have Huntington's or not. The other situation is predictive, All right? And so this is when you don't have any symptoms of Huntington's, but maybe someone in your family has Huntington's disease and you're at risk and you want to know if you carry the mutation. So just a couple words about predictive genetic testing. Um, genetic counseling is very strongly advised prior to um, having this type of testing done. It's a very personal choice, so it's not a choice that you have to do or have to make, it's individual. Um, some of the potential reasons that, you know, I see when patients come for predictive testing, a lot of future planning, relieving uncertainty are probably the two most common that I hear. Um, and we typically don't do predictive testing in minors or children. Um, since we don't have a treatment, we would offer that child. And we usually will have them wait until they're 18 years old to make their own decision whether they want to find out if they have the mutation or not. And again, just a couple of caveats or things to keep in mind that when you do predictive testing, it still does not tell you when you're gonna develop symptoms of Huntington's disease, even if it's positive. Um, and there's also this unknown range, the 36 to 39, where it doesn't actually then tell you whether you're, you're going to develop Huntington's disease or not. All right, but thanks to HDSA, we have a great um, genetic testing protocol for Huntington's disease and predictive testing. Um, I encourage anyone that's considering predictive testing um, to locate a center of excellence. So we follow these guidelines um, at each of our centers of excellence. Great, I've included the um, websites here as well, but most of these websites I have are at hdsa.org. Okay, so let's move into the clinical symptoms of Huntington's. All right, so here again, this is a similar graph that we looked at before. Okay, just a little different. So you've got your number of your CAG repeats on the horizontal line, and your age and motor symptom onset, the vertical line. All right, so you're, at, at, you know, looking here, you can, you know, estimate the average age of onset just based on eyeballing it, but it's around 30s to 50s. Um, we talked about the correlation between how long the CAG repeat length is and when symptoms start. Um, and so there's a couple situations where a new diagnosis of Huntington's disease can arise without a known family history. So it could be that the parents have, you know, passed away at an early age for an unexpected reason or another known medical reason. 
um, or it could have been the anticipation, so that the symptoms are actually presenting in the child before they're presenting in the parent. Okay. All right, and we actually we got some nice pictures this morning um, uh, of a, a section of Huntington's disease brain. Um, so the butterfly that was described earlier is here in the middle. That's the ventricles where your space is. And this is just showing the shrinkage of the brain over time. Um, and so as the brain shrinks, you can see there's less brain volume that you can appreciate here on the right. Those ventricles or that space, just it takes up that space. So the fluid just fills that space. And so the part of the brain that's most affected in Huntington's disease right, is the medium spiny neuron, which is in the caudate nucleus, which is a part of the deep structures in the brain called the basal ganglia. The main purpose of the basal ganglia is to help moderate movement or modulate movement. And so um, that's why, you know, you have symptoms of Huntington's disease that are related to movement. But in addition to that, the basal ganglia talks to the rest of the brain, okay, which can also lead to problems with behaviors, mood, um, and cognition as well. I'm sorry, this cut that off there a little bit. Okay, so your, your average clinical course of Huntington's disease is variable, right? It's still individual. Each person is different in their experience with HD. On average, 10 to 30 years from symptom onset um, to having severe disability or death in the adult HD patient. In a juvenile Huntington's patient, um, the average um, course of the disease is going to be much is going to be shorter more toward the 10 years but if you present at age 60 you may you may still live to be 80 80 years old without any problems so everyone is different um, juvenile hd i just have a little a little discussion here about juvenile hd um, so this is a higher number of repeats and the um, and the onset of movement symptoms start before the age of 20. Okay, so this is even, this is a rare occurrence of a rare disease. <laughs> so this is five to 10% of all patients with HD. Um, and actually when George Huntington first described Huntington's disease, he described it as an adult disease and said that it did not affect children. And so we now know that to not be true. Now, especially now that we know more about the genetics and that actually children usually present with different symptoms, which is why they probably didn't recognize that it was actually juvenile Huntington's because chorea is very rare in children and they get more of that slowness and stiffness. All right, so we talked about the movement symptoms in Huntington's disease. So in addition to movement symptoms, there's also cognitive symptoms and behavioral symptoms. Okay, you, there are some patients that have a history of changes in behavior or mood before symptoms begin. Um, but again, that is not enough to make to say, oh, you know, you've had worsening of your mood or you're more anxious or you're more irritable, it has to be HD, because that's also common in the general population. To make a clinical diagnosis of HD, um, we still need to have movement symptoms. There is some discussion in the literature and hopefully in the future to also include cognitive symptoms as a part of our clinical diagnosis. So that is likely coming soon. All right, so let's break down all the different types of symptoms you can have with Huntington's. So motor symptoms, your chorea is your most common or classic movement symptom. That's been described as involuntary, described as writhing, sometimes dance-like, seems to be very random. Um, it's very fast and really quick. Um, other involuntary movements that co-occur with the chorea or can occur in the absence of chorea include some of these I've listed. So dystonia, this is an, a sustained muscle contracture. So this could be that you know your neck or your trunk or your arms or hands kind of get stuck in weird positions. Um, and most of the time that's not painful, but it can be. Uh, myoclonus can look very similar to chorea, um, really quick, fast, jerky movements. We talked about bradykinesia is our, you know, our term for slowness of movements that also happens with HD. Um, and ataxia is our term for impaired coordination. So not just chorea, so it's more like chorea plus. Um, so the other movement symptoms um, that we think of when we think of HD involve speech, swallowing, and balance. So with speech, the chorea um, can actually affect the way that the mouth moves and how you produce speech, can cause slurring of speech, um, you can also have motor delays where it's hard to get the words out that you want to say, um, which is a common complaint in, with Huntington's patients. 
You can also have trouble with swallowing. So there could be incoordination in swallowing. Usually doing things like taking your time, taking it slow, chewing completely will sometimes help that. Um, walking and balance problems is somewhat from the chorea, could be from dystonia or stiffness, but also is a part of the disease. So things like lurching while walking, um, plopping down or like really just kind of falling down into the chair um, can come with HD as well. All right, so cognitive symptoms in HD. Um, so I want to point out that it's much different than if you think of something like Alzheimer's disease. All right, so in Huntington's disease, memory is usually not the first problem. Now, memory can be a problem later in the disease, but it's usually not what's impaired early on. What's more impaired are things like executive functioning. So I still view executive functioning as kind of an abstract term, okay? But what that means is it's hard to do things like multitasking. Um, it's hard to do, um, uh, to judge or to uh, have better judgment of situations, do problem solving. Um, patients may be easily distracted, have trouble with attention, concentration, right? And so some of these cognitive symptoms can actually start prior to movement symptoms. So sometimes this is what people notice if they're in really high, high demanding or high stress job, right? If it's hard for you to, to multitask and to make a list of what you need to do that day, or remember you need to follow up on certain tasks, that can start impairing your job before you start to mo notice movement symptoms. Um, deficits in recognizing facial emotions is common. Um, so this could be frustrating to a family member or friend where you're really upset and the person with Huntington's disease is, seems to be not bothered by the fact that you're upset. <laughs> but it may not be that they, they just don't understand or can't recognize that you're upset like they used to. And the anosognosia, so this is something very um, unique to HD or Huntington's disease. Um, where there, some patients seem to have just a lack of insight, so are not able to recognize when they're having symptoms or that they're having the disease or that, you know, they're having problems with movement or they're having falls. We'll kind of make excuses. You know, we'll say that, oh, you know, anyone could trip or anyone could fall like that or no, I don't have any movements. I don't have any problems with my speech or swallowing, even though someone's like, well, you just choked this morning. Um, so there could be a severe lack of insight um, in Huntington's. And, Sometimes that's a symptom that is, um, can be treated if um, addressed early on. All right, behavioral symptoms, very, very common in Huntington's. So they're not included in our diagnostic criteria for Huntington's disease, but very frequently co-occur. Um, so apathy or decreased motivation, all right, is the only behavioral symptom that tends to worsen with the disease. All of the other behavioral symptoms I'm going to mention they can start with the disease, they can get better with the disease, they can get better and then worse again, so it can kind of fluctuate and it's not as consistent. Um, but apathy and decreased motivation will happen in almost everybody with Huntington's disease. Sometimes this can present as just no longer having a desire to take a shower, no longer wanting to brush your teeth. Um, in addition to not wanting to do things that um, people or the, that person used to enjoy. Depression is another very common symptom. Um, and suicide rates of 5 to 10 percent within the Huntington's disease population, which is much higher than the average um, um, incidence of suicide rates um, otherwise just in the normal population. Um, attempts are even higher than that, so 25 percent. So this is a symptom that is, should always be addressed. We always ask it every clinical visit to make sure that we address it and treat it as early on as possible if someone's having these types of thoughts. So we have a lot of treatments available that can help these symptoms. Um, obsessive compulsive behaviors are common. Anxiety, irritability, impulsivity, insomnia. There are just so many. All right, so I'll just touch on a couple more here or define them a little bit better. So perseveration or obsessiveness. Um, another way of thinking about this is broken record thinking. All right, so you may say, okay, so we're gonna go to the doctor today, right? Uh-huh, yep, in an hour. Five minutes later, we're gonna go to the doctor again, right? Like, yeah, you just asked, wait, are you sure we're gonna go to the doctor? Or do we have everything? Are we gonna go to the doctor? Just kind of over and over and over, right? So this type of perseveration or obsessiveness is also a symptom of the disease. So irritability is also common, and irritability sometimes co-occurs with impulsivity. So irritability being that just a shorter fuse, more impatient um, than say someone used to be before HD, an impulsivity could be a de or, um, 
less of a filter. So for example, someone may say something inappropriate out in public and immediately afterwards like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't, I don't know, it just, it just came out. Like I thought it and I said it and I, I didn't think about it, right? But just the, the key here is at the bottom is that we have treatments available to address each of these symptoms. And so make sure you're bringing up these symptoms with your provider. All right, so moving on to treatments. All right, we have no proven treatments that slow or stop the progression of HD. However, we have a lot of treatments available that treat the symptoms of Huntington's disease. And these treatments that we have available to treat the movement symptoms, behavioral symptoms, can make a huge impact on someone's quality of life, right? If maybe instead of asking, you know, having that perseverative, are we going to the doctor, are we going to the doctor, instead of it being every five minutes, maybe it's every couple of hours. Right, that can have a huge impact on a person with HD or family members um, who are also living with someone with HD. Same thing with treating the movement. So treating the chorea can also help the balance, can help the swallowing, can help the speech. Right? So instead of needing to use a walker, can now walk independently, can do tasks every day on their own. Great. And the treatments we have for the behavioral changes we see in Huntington's, um, are used for other psychiatric disease as well. And so in Huntington's disease, those treatments or medications are just as effective. All right, so besides medicine, the other most important thing um, or treatment for Huntington's disease is your multidisciplinary care team, All right? This is your physical therapist, your speech therapist, occupational therapist, dietitian, especially your social worker. Um, and our HDSA Centers of Excellence Centers have the multidisciplinary team set up, All right? So that's another great reason to, you know, have a physician you see at a COE center. Um, for cognitive symptoms, we don't have a lot of, or we don't have any pharmacologic treatments available yet specifically for HD, um, but there are other, you know, non-medication coping strategies that can be useful. All right, and that segues into participating in research. Um, so this is a great way to find connection, find hope. I know Enroll HD was mentioned earlier. That's a great observational study that if you just want to participate, but maybe you don't want to try a new medication, don't want to try an experimental trial, observational trials are a great way for you to just contribute. And it is very important that our Huntington's patients and community are very active in our clinical research because that's how we are going to find a cure. All right, and I've clued, I think some of these were mentioned. So HD Trial Finder was mentioned this morning. HD Buzz, you guys know all about now. Um, and Huntington Study Group also um, is involved in clinical research with HD. Okay, great. Some other important topics within Huntington's disease to, to know about and to recognize. One is disability. Okay, so I said the average age of onset for HD is in your 30s to 50s, which is generally before people are at the age of retirement. Um, and so a lot of people with HD always thinking about this as early as possible, even though if you have HD and you're still doing well, doing everything at work, you keep going. You keep doing your job as long as you can, but make sure that you're prepared or ready to, you know, what are you gonna do when you start having difficulty? Um, and having all of that in place ahead of time. Uh, balancing safety versus autonomy, right? That's another important concept. We want people with Huntington's to be able to do as much as they can for as long as they can and independently as they can. Um, and so that's why talk, working with your provider to get therapies and get treatments so that you're still able to continue doing that as long as possible. Um, other considerations are talking with children, having kids, um, considering having kids and having a history of HD or HD in your family. Um, no time to talk about all these today, but different, you know, other, you know, topics in Huntington's disease that are also important. And all these things are available um, on HDSA's website. All right, and the stigma and lack of public awareness of HD. So HD is still a rare disease. Occasionally you'll, you're, gonna, you're gonna see it on TV shows. Um, some of the portrayals of Huntington's disease are not as, um, are not portrayed as well as I would have hoped they would have been. Um, and so I, I'd encourage all of you, it's your job, you know, as someone with HD or someone who knows someone with HD to educate the community. So it's not that they don't want to know, they may just not know what Huntington's disease is. All right, and care partners in HD. We can't forget this, right? So there are, there's a lot of stress that can come with being, having HD yourself, a lot of stress coming with living with someone with HD. 
um, helping taking care of someone with HD, but still working, still having kids or having to parent. So there might be a lot of different tasks you're trying to jumble. Um, and so there are resources available for care. I like the term care partner, uh, but caregiver um, to help kind of, you know, help your moderate your expectations, reduce your stress, make sure that you're still taking time to take care of yourself before you can take care of someone else. Um, as I talked about with disability, also kind of planning ahead for the future. Okay, what's, you know, what's it going to be like when, you know, things get too hard to manage at home if they do? Having a plan or at least thought about it ahead of time. It's always better to plan ahead and not need it than to be in the moment, oh my gosh, I need this now and have nothing set up or planned. Okay, so we're going to end on a happy note. Okay, so I encourage all of you to get involved. So if this, if you're not interested in research, just getting involved in your community, talking to other people who have HD, talking to other families, coming to convention where you can meet a bunch of great people with HD, um, and those of us who work with HD families, local support groups, HD team hope walks. I feel like they are all the time. <laughs> I don't know if they're every week, but it seems like there's always another team hope walk happening. Um, we just had our first one in Mississippi this year, which was great. All right. All right, and so here are my final thoughts. Okay, so HD is a hard disease. Um, but I want everyone to remember that there is hope, that there's a lot of hope in Huntington's disease. There are, you know, despite the, um, you know, our negative clinical trial we had that, you know, came to fruition in the last year and a half, um, there are, that has not stopped us from doing other research, right? We're learning from why that didn't, why didn't that go well? And we are learning so that we can finally get to a cure. Um, and how I like to think about it is that was a necessary clinical trial that we were gonna do either way. That was the way medicine was going. And now that we know it didn't work, we can figure out why it didn't work. Um, and that will take us to the next step, getting closer and closer to a cure. Huntington's disease, again, it's a rare disease, but I'm just, I still am amazed at just the type of community HD has, um, the support that's available for HD families, and that we will fight this disease together. Okay, no one could do it by themselves. All right, and then this is just a thanks or a shout out to our UAB Center of Excellence team. This is not everybody. We continue to grow despite the pandemic. We got more people interested and more disciplines interested in Huntington's disease. All right, great. I wanted to leave some time for questions. So thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Marissa. That was lovely. Now's an opportunity to ask some questions uh, of her. She's open to anything you're thinking, and um, let's have some questions and answers, okay? All right, so I understand we're just going to say them out loud, correct? Raise your hand, okay, because <laughs> we couldn't figure out the app here. She's, she's going to go work on it <laughs> and see if we can get the questions here. But if anyone wants to stand up and ask their question. I have a question on my phone. Yeah, do you want to read it on our phone? Sure. Oh, you can see all the questions? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, I'll go to the top. Okay, first question is how can I find an HD community in my area? Great question. HDSA.org um, has a great um, section on how to find local chapters. Also, you're um, locating your center of excellence. Um, if it's a center of, center of excellence within your state, contacting that center of ex excellence, your social worker who's affiliated can also give you great resources. And their contact information um, is on HDSA's um, center of excellence website. All right, great question I have here. How is myoclonus different than chorea? Great question. I will tell you in the movement disorder community, we can't have a movement disorder conference without two experts in the field arguing over myoclonus versus chorea versus tremor. <laughs> and so they are definitely on a spectrum because chorea can sometimes be really fast. Generally with chorea, it's fast, but then kind of slow. Usually myoclonus is just fast and then stops. Great question. All right, and so what ways do children with juvenile Huntington's present with HD differently? So juvenile Huntington's disease doesn't usually have that chorea. So instead of the chorea, patients are gonna look Parkinsonian. So if you guys know what a Parkinson's patient looks like, they're really slow, no facial expression. 
they don't move very fast, maybe really slow to respond. Those are um, symptoms you usually see with a juvenile Huntington's disease. Great. And so if you were to see, so for example, if you saw chorea in a child, you shouldn't be thinking Huntington's. That would be very unusual for that to be Huntington's disease. Um, if you have chorea in a child, it'll be, it should most likely be from another disease. Okay, any information? Okay, question about twins. All right, is one always positive or can both be negative? And so for twins, right, it's gonna depend if they're fraternal twins or identical twins. All right, so identical twins should have the same genetic information. But fraternal twins, it would be your, say, 50% chance for each, right, because they're gonna be two fertilized embryos that are separate, with separate information, or genetic information. Okay, question about anticipation. Okay, so let's say, for example, a father has borderline results. Um, so that in the, could be 36 to 39, could be the 27 to 35. Does anticipation always happen is the question. The answer is no. <laughs> anticipation does not always happen. Um, and it also does not always happen when the dad or father has Huntington's and then the child gets Huntington's. That anticipation also doesn't always happen. Sometimes it is the same number. Um, so it's just a higher risk, just knowing that we see it, that happens sometimes, just not all the time. Okay. So I'm not, um, so I'll read the question. Um, if your parent has it or has HD and you test negative, are you still more likely um, than people who don't have HD in their family to have a higher number or closer to borderline than normal? Okay, reading it out loud helped. <laughs> um, so if you test negative, and so if you're, you have two repeat lengths that are 26 or lower, you're negative, and that's, you're the same as a negative person in the general population, okay, that there's no, um, I mean, there's always a de novo chance or a rare chance, but there's, you know, that should be, you know, like George Huntington said, kind of the end of the, the passing on from generation to generation. I hope I answered that correctly if someone's in the room. <laughs> Great question. Okay. okay, so the question was, make sure I'm summarizing this correctly, is that their um, parent, patient's parent, has not chosen to get tested, so father does not want to get tested, but his siblings, have Huntington's, have Huntington's. And so I guess the question was whether, um, if he doesn't end up showing symptoms, was his borderline, was his negative, or was it in between? That's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> so knowing sometimes when you know the, um, the repeat lengths of the siblings and you know the parents' repeat length, you can kind of, you can guess, you know, if it was positive, what it should be. But if it comes from the father, if there's always a chance there's anticipation. Um, and so without really getting genetic testing, it's, it's hard to know for sure. I hope that answers the question. Okay. There's more questions at the top of the list. Oh, there is? Oh, well, thank you. I was reading it backwards. Okay. Are there more centers of excellence being built? Great question. So as a part of um, HDSA Centers of Excellence programs, so level one centers of excellence, one of the criteria is that there's, they have a partner site, which they're trying to train and help grow to eventually be an HD center of excellence. And so that is always ongoing. Um, UAB is a level one center of excellence, and so we had, we had two, partner, two partner sites, one in Mississippi at UMMS, UMM Medical Center, C. UMMC, and then we also have a partner site in University of South Alabama. And very excitingly, UMMC is now their own level three center of excellence. And so that is a part of the HDSA um, center of excellence program is to help identify and promote future sites. Oh, great question. All right, so what are the statistics, statistics of both patients um, having HD? Is that right? Both parents? So both parents being HD positive and not knowing they're HD positive? Is that the question? Uh, 
if both parents have Huntington's, what's the chance that the child would have Huntington's? So that's going to be 75%. So that is assuming, so almost everybody, unless you live in Lake Maracaibo or somewhere where there is a lot, there are a lot of Huntington's patients having children together, usually someone with Huntington's disease only has one abnormal copy. And so if each parent has one abnormal copy and one normal copy, right, there's only a 25% chance that the child will get both normal copies. It's a much higher chance that the child would get two or one abnormal copy. And that would be a situation where the child could have two. Um, both, both mutated Huntington genes. Um, what's interesting about that, though, is that um, just because you have two doesn't mean they add together. So if you have a 40 and a 40, it doesn't mean you have an 80. If you have two 40s, you're still going to present in a similar, similar way that someone would who had a 40. And all that information is because of all the research that was done in Lake Maracaibo, because there were some children there that had both. I think we can take questions from the audience. Yeah, so the question was if the child had two, or, you know, was unfortunate that had two of the abnormal or mutated Huntington genes, then yes, every child would inherit an abnormal copy and would have Huntington's. Great question. Great. I think that's... It, unless the question was um, if so if the child tests positive okay what does that mean about the parents right does that mean one of those parents is positive um, so there are a couple of scenarios so one I would say most likely probably yes that one of the parents has Huntington's disease um, and just hasn't started showing symptoms yet. In that situation, it's usually because it came from the father. Um, but it could also be um, that, usually also with the father, that the father, maybe they have an indeterminate range, that 36 to 39, or they have one of those unstable, you know, repeat numbers of 27 to 35, and that it just, it got bigger or larger um, in the next generation. And so that parent may never actually go on to develop Huntington's disease. But really, genetic testing would be the only way to determine. A good question. Generally, only anticipation happens with the father. Not that it can't help it happen with the mother. We have seen it, but it's very rare. And it's not, it's not large. Re large increases in number. So something like you had, mother had a 42, maybe the child has a 43. Um, but with the father being the parent, sometimes it could be you have father has a 43 and the child has a 63. And so then in that situation, the, usually the child's going to present much earlier than the dad would. Okay. I think I answered that question. Are we good? Or is that, is that, okay. That's all the questions I see. Great. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the convention. Get free food. It's everywhere. <laughs>